All right, let's get started. How are you guys doing? Monday? Week seven? Go Broncos? Yeah? Um, so remember, we have a test a week from today. Okay, module three. It's just our structure, structure module. So we'll have trusses, frames, frames that we're doing today, and then machines. And that's what we're covering on Wednesday. So it's a pretty short module. Um, the methods are all very similar. So I hope that you guys are feeling good with this stuff so far. The math, at least, isn't crazy, right? Okay. Um, so last week, we we finally began structures. We finally began applying all of these tools and this vector analysis and all of this stuff that you may have thought was just for your misery, misery but it's actually to apply. Um, so we actually applied them to structures and began being engineers, and we began with trusses. Um, and so in order to accurately analyze trusses, we needed to take into account two types of forces. As a quick review, what, what were those types of forces? Internal and external. Nailed it. Okay. What's the difference between the two? Anybody remember? Yeah, Mike? The external forces were caused by like uh, different loading conditions or um, reactions from um, supports. Perfect. And then internal forces were caused by members acting on each other. Yes, exactly. So what Mike said is external forces are caused by known applied forces or reaction forces that are holding your structure into equilibrium. Okay, a distributed loading, a point load, a pin connection, a fixed connection, a roller connection, all of those external, external forces okay, are acting on the body. And in internal forces, Mike said they were, what did you say? They were caused by the members, okay? but just in a more general term, those are the forces that are kind of holding, holding your structure together. Okay, if, like, if you recall that member of a person walking, your internal forces are the forces between your, your bones and your muscles and stuff that it's holding together okay, and actually making you move. Okay, and so in, in structures, those internal forces um, are those tension and compression loading conditions in each of the members. Okay, and how do we indicate tension or compression? What's that? Compression is negative and tension is positive. Okay, that's our sign convention that when we're analyzing whether with method of joints or method of sections, we always draw them, these internal forces in tension and let our sign convention apply that intuition. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff okay, that you will be tested on, whether it be in a problem or in a conceptual question. So just make sure your this stuff is coming naturally, okay? So we covered trusses on Wednesday and Friday, okay, and there were some very distinct characteristics of a truss. Do you guys remember what those were? What's that? Composed it's composed of triangles, but that's because of a couple different characteristics. That's absolutely right. Okay. Yeah, Carson? Uh, forces only act on the joints. Forces only act on the joints. Yeah? Two force members. Two force members. Yeah, Jack? All the members are straight. You can't have a member that intersects in the middle of another. You can't have a member that intersects in the middle of another. Okay, that would, that kind of goes along the lines with two force members, and mem and the the joints, forces are only loaded at the joints. Okay. And there's one more. Talking about the type of connection. Pin connections within that, within that fr uh, that truss. What's being held together are pin connections. Okay, and we're going to go into, into depth with this um, tomorrow in pre-lab. Don't let me forget, I have a couple things to say about that at the end. Um, we're going to be going into these characteristics, which is a good review for your test. Okay? But in summary, we have pin connections in a truss. They're always two force members, and they're always loaded to the connections. And those collectively make a truss be composed of triangles. Okay, that's more of a qualitative assessment. But in order to satisfy those conditions, a truss needs to be composed of triang triangular sections, at least a simple truss. Okay? So a frame, okay, a frame is a different, different than a truss. They have very similar, um, similar characteristics in that a frame is a structure okay, that's designed to hold 
to just a holder support loading conditions that's composed of at least one multi-force member. Okay, so this frame okay, is very similar to a truss in that they're supporting loads and that they are fully constrained. So that fully constrained means that they're not moving, they're not transmitting loads in any way, they're just support structures, okay, and that means that they are inherently rigid. Okay, I think looking at your reading quizzes, that concept of a rigid frame or a truss is a little confusing. But just know that rigid, in terms of structures, means that it is fully constrained. Okay. So these multi-force members, okay, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, they exist on a frame for a variety of reasons, okay, and they are listed up here. Um, the first being that a load isn't always necessarily just fixed at a joint. Okay. Loads move, or they may need to um, contain a distributed load, or a variety of different reasons okay, that we can't be as simple as saying we're only loading at the joint. Okay. So a frame can be loaded both at the joint <coughs> and within the middle of a member. Okay. <coughs> the, second, the second condition is that there are more constraints than pin connections. Okay. This couldn't happen in a truss because we only had two equations of equilibrium. So we can, we can have different types of constraints. We can have fixed connections, roller connections, all kinds of these constraints that are supporting, supporting the frame. And this goes to what Mike said on Friday, your question about what if there's a constraint that causes a, a, a moment, a resultant moment. Okay? What type of constraint do we know that causes that? Yes, yeah, Sarah? Fixed a fixed connection. Okay. Trusses are only supported by those pin connections okay, that's only preventing against translation. There's no rotational constraints. With frames, okay, we, can be, we can be supported and constrained by a variety of different constraints, and that's because we no longer are restricted to two force members. Okay. And finally, the last condition is that a member can have uh, more than two joints. Okay. We, can fix, we can fix a member within the middle of another member, okay, whereas with a truss, you would need three separate, three separate members, okay? So as always, okay, to analyze a frame, there's a very systematic approach. The first two steps, I hope you're getting quite comfortable with, okay? Analyzing the structure as a whole and solving for those external reactions, okay? Those are known external reactions. And we'll do a couple examples in which you'll see that we may not get everything out of those steps right away, that doesn't mean we're, we're completely out of luck, all right? The third and fourth step are where the concept of a frame and a truss differ. Okay, with a truss, we either had our method of joints okay, or, or our method of sections, both of which we kind of, we isolated an individual joint, okay, or just made a cut to isolate those internal forces. Okay, with a frame, okay, we're going to be excluding these rigid bodies Okay, and analyzing them as a whole. And we're not cutting them, we're not analyzing just the joint, we're going to analyze the rigid body of each member collectively. Okay. So when you're analyzing a frame, you're going to isolate each of the individual rigid bodies that compose the frame, okay, and then apply your equations of equilibrium. Okay. And that, that last step, is, or those, that third and fourth step, brings up the main advantage of the analysis of a frame over a truss. Because if we can analyze each individual rigid body okay, collectively, how many unknowns can we solve for? How many equations of equilibrium do we have? Three. Okay. So if we're analyzing each individual rigid body with three equations of equilibrium, what does that say about our number of unknowns? For each rigid body, but as, as a whole. A lot, okay? We can solve for three times as many of the number of free body diagrams we have, okay? Because we're isolating these free body diagrams of these rigid bodies, okay? These rigid bodies are, are these members, okay? And then we're applying our three equations of equilibrium. So the number of unknowns you can solve for in a frame is greater than in a truss, okay? 
and you'll see that that is the case when we look at these different types of connections. Okay, so I want, I want to make sure of that brief kind of verbal overview of the difference between a frame and a truss, okay, because they're very distinct differences, okay, and I want to make sure you understand that because that changes our analysis, okay, because of these two force members, okay, with a truss, with a two force member, that's when we use our method of joints or method of sections, but with a frame, with these multi-force members, we can isolate them, okay. So if we look at this example, okay, of this structure that's supported both by a pulley and at this fixed connection. Okay, and if you think way back to rigid bodies, okay, what's your first step? If you have multiple rigid bodies and you want to analyze one of them, what's your first step? You isolate that, that rigid body, that collective rigid body of interest, that collective structure. So in this case, we want to um, identify the two and three force members so we're going to be looking at just this support structure. Okay, so if we draw the free body diagram, it's a world ending. Okay, we draw our free body diagram of the entire structure. We have our known forces and our constraint forces, and we also need to take into account the forces of the pulley. Okay, but the, because these are applying an external force on this frame, okay, we need to take into account that. So how many unknowns do we have on this, on this frame? Six, I've heard six. Why is it a frame? Let's start there. Why is this a frame and not a truss? Because there's a fixed connection. A couple other reasons, yeah, Jack? We have at least one We have at least one three force member. Okay, that's because we see these forces that aren't applied at the joint. Okay, and what else? There's one other reason. Yeah, Morris? Because BC intersects AD. Exactly, because BC intersects AD. I should probably indicate what those are. Okay, because BC intersects the in the middle of AD. Okay, so how many unknowns do we have? We know our applied force and we know the weight. We'll start there. These known external forces. Do we know any of the reaction forces? So there's three, right? We don't know AX, AY, MA. Do we know the tension in the rope? That's still an internal force of that rope. Okay, we don't know the tension. Okay, even though it wasn't explicitly stated, okay, so six would have been right if you weren't given the external forces. Okay, but for the sake of this example, we know the applied force and we know, we know both of the applied forces. So we have four unknowns. And how many equations do we have? We have three equations of equilibrium, right, in two dimensions, always. Okay, so if this was a truss and it's not, we can't solve for it because we need to know our external forces right away. Because you need to start with, at least with the method of joints, start with something, uh, a joint that has two unknowns or less. Okay? So with the frame, okay, we solve for these external forces as much as we can. Okay? In this case, there's only four unknowns. There's four unknowns and three equations, so we can only solve for three of the unknowns. Okay? And that's okay because our next step is we need to isolate out the individual members, okay? So if we look at member DC, okay, we isolate that individual member and apply all of the forces, okay, both internal and external, okay? And I want to talk a bit about this known weight, these known forces, 
Okay. Where do we apply them if we have member DC and member BC? Where do we apply this weight? Who says both? Who says one or the other? Okay, Jack, you were very adamant. Why do you say both? Okay. Okay. Who said who said one or the other? Who's brave enough to tell us what they think? Stefan, you raised your hand. Okay. You're gonna trust the beer in Johnston? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Can you say it in your own words? Okay, that's fine. No, that's fine. Mike, you were, you were raising your hand. Yeah, I think um, it's a chain connection, so technically that weight, I think, gets distributed between those two, but you can just apply it to one of those members, and that covers both of those. That's exactly right. Okay, this force is applied to both members, okay, but this is a pin connection, and this is not a constraint, okay. If, if it was a constraint, you would have to draw it equal and opposite as we isolate our free body diagrams. Okay, and we'll see that on our constraint forces, but these known external forces, okay, we draw them applying just on one of our free body diagrams, okay, because the load is applied on the pin and not these members. If we would draw them on both, okay, to satisfy Newton's second law, you would have to draw them equal and opposite, right? But we know that our our weight, this external force, does not look like that. Okay. So because the force is applied at the pin, okay, which we are including in this rigid body, you choose, okay, it's up to you, to choose where it is applied. Does that make sense? Your intuition would tell you to apply it to both. Okay. But with these known external forces that are acting at the pin, okay, know that they are not acting equally and opposite. Okay. Only our constraint forces do. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to choose to apply this weight to member DC. Okay. And I also need to take into account my known external force. Okay, they also have these constraint forces at CY and CX and DX and DY. Okay, remember that with your constraint forces, your sign, okay, however you choose to draw them is completely up to you and the math will tell you if you've drawn them correctly or not. Okay. Do you ha anybody have any questions on why I chose these constraint these forces? Yeah, Jack. We've also chosen not to apply tension. Exactly. We've also chosen not to apply this tension force to DC. So what member will I need to include it on? What's that? D yeah, DA. Okay, only the constraint forces act equally and opposite. So if I look at member BC, okay, and I draw my constraint forces at C, they now need to be equal and opposite, right? In order to satisfy equilibrium or Newton's second law, these need to be equal and opposite. Okay. We also have constraint forces at B. I'll draw BX and BY. Okay. And then I'm going to erase. Okay. 
So now we draw ABD. Okay. I draw my tension forces. Okay. And I need to draw dy okay, and dx equal and opposite to how it was drawn in member dc at those shared connections, equal and opposite. Same with my force, my constraint at b. dx. Okay. I'm going to change this sign for the purpose of the example. Okay, and we also have these reaction forces at A. Okay. So in these rigid bodies, each rigid body being a member, apply every force, known and unknown, external, internal. Okay. Apply every force. And do it in a very piecewise manner, okay, before you start solving. Okay. Because the next step when you're analyzing a frame okay, is to identify two force members. Okay, so remember back three or four weeks now when we first introduced rigid bodies, what is a two force member? Who remembers? Yes, someone? The forces are only applied at the ends. Yeah, okay, I would buy that. But what's specific about those forces? In statics, at least. Yeah, Will? Uh, they're equal and opposite on the same line of action. They're equal and opposite on the same line of action. That's perfect. I couldn't have said it better. Okay, two force members, okay, because this is statics, we know they need to be equal and opposite on the same line of action in order to maintain static equilibrium, right? So I can replace these two force members okay, with those known resultants that we know need to be equal and opposite. Okay. So we immediately can identify BC as a two force member. Okay. And I know that in order for there to be equilibrium, the resultant force of the constraints at C and B need to be equal and opposite. Is that ringing any bells? Rigid bodies way back. Okay. So now we can go through and update our rigid body free body diagrams okay, with our known resultant force of the two force members. And what this does is this reduces the number of unknowns. Okay. And not every frame is going to have two force members. Okay. We're going to do an example that doesn't have any. Okay. But if there are, reduce the number of unknowns. Okay. And update your sign conventions across your free body diagrams. And then, then, then the math will follow through to tell you if you've guessed correctly. Okay. Any questions on the method itself? Okay. The first two steps you guys are pros at, solving for your reactions. Depending on the constraints, you may not be able to solve for all of them. Okay. Then you need to isolate each rigid body. Okay. Draw all of the forces on it, internal and external, known and unknown. Okay, solve for your two-force and three-force members and then update. And then apply your equations of equilibrium to each member. Yeah, Jack? So at the points where members connect, for example, the top of A, B, D, and the far left of B, C, is drawing your DX and DY in opposite directions, is that sort of overriding our draw everything in tension cardinal rule? Yeah, these aren't internal forces. These are external constraints. Okay, and so when your intuition about guessing um, the weight, we know they need to be equal and opposite in that constraint. Okay, so it's not kind of two different concepts because it's an external force. So whichever force is pushing on A, B, C to the right, for example, is also pushing on B, C to the left. 
equal and opposite. All, force, all forces must have an equal and opposite reaction. Okay. All right. So let's apply an example in which we can actually do some analysis on. Okay, so we have this frame that's connected at A and D, which these are pin constraints. Okay, if my excellent PowerPoint drawing skills aren't clear, okay, for, for example, in a test, make sure you ask. Okay, that's fair game. They're connected at pin constraints at A and D, so they're preventing translation in what directions? Y and X. Okay, so if I draw my free body diagram of the entire structure, A Y, A X, D Y, D X, and 800 newtons. Okay, that spans nine meters and four meters. Okay. So your first step in any sort of structural analysis is what. What's that? Free body, diagram. Free body diagram. And then, say it with confidence, Libby. Solve for the reactions. Solve for the reactions. Okay. So we have four reactions here. And we have how many equations of equilibrium? Three. So we're not going to be able to do everything, which is fine. Okay. So in order to solve for these reactions, I need to start somewhere. Okay. Where would you guys start? Eight. Not yet. Okay. Remember, before you start doing that, you need to solve for the reaction forces. Okay. So don't jump in and start pulling members out before we know these external forces. Okay. What would you say, Drew? Sum the moments at A or D. Sum the moments at A or D. Okay. Get rid of a couple of the unknowns, right? So the way I worked it is I sum the moments at A. Summing the moments at D is just as fine. Asher, did you have a question? Yeah. Are you going to answer the question? Okay. Sum the moments at A, okay, because I then know that AX and AY, okay, we're negating those. So for DX times 4, okay, that horizontal force and that vertical distance is causing a counterclockwise rotation about A, okay, minus 800 times 9, okay, that vertical force and that horizontal distance is causing a clockwise rotation equals 0, okay. So I can immediately solve for dx to be 800 newtons. Excellent. Okay. Wait, that Did I solve it wrong? 1800? 1800? Yeah, it's 1800. DX is 800? Oh. What I, 800. Did I say 800? Yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry. DX is 1800. My fault. <coughs> okay. Always make sure you guys are always checking my math. Okay. So we've solved for dx. What would now be a, a next efficient logical step? Yeah, sure. Yeah, some of the forces in the y. Okay. You said ay plus dy minus 800 equals 0. Can we do anything with that yet? <coughs> nope, and that's fine. Okay, with a truss, with a truss, it probably would be a problem. <coughs> this is a frame, and so now our third and final equation. So sum the forces in the x. Okay, so we have ax plus eighteen hundred equals zero. Okay, and in solving for ax, 
we get negative 1800 newtons, okay, and that tells us that we have guessed incorrectly of AX and that it is in fact pointed in the negative I direction. Is this stuff coming more natural to you guys the more you, you do this? This is like the easy part of the problem? Okay. And so now, Keenan, what do we do? Uh, focus on <coughs> so now we focus on the members. Okay. So we're going to draw the free body diagrams of the individual members. Okay. So I'll start with ABC, okay, that top horizontal member. Okay, and if we draw our forces on there, we have AY, which we don't know yet. AX, I'm going to update my sign. 1800 newtons in the negative I. Okay. I have a force at B, a constraint at B, and a constraint at C. Okay. So now let's look at member BE. What forces go on here, Chase? Who can help Chase out? What forces go on member BE? We have BY going down. We have BY, okay, and we're going to go down. Okay. Let's say we have EY going up. EY going up. And EX going up. And EX going what? Right. Okay, fantastic. Is that it? We need BX to the left. Doesn't matter. Well, it matters. I need to draw it equal and opposite. Okay. So now let's look at member CF. Okay. So now what forces go on here? What do you think, Sally? CX to the left, okay? That one doesn't matter. We don't, we haven't made a guess on that one yet. Perfect. Okay. Okay, and our last member is member DEF, that bottom horizontal member. So Patrick, what forces go on here? Okay, the reaction force is at D. We still don't know what DY is, but we know that DX okay, is 1800 newtons. Then a downward force for EY, okay, yep. EY, EX, both equal and opposite to what we drew on BE. And a downward, yeah. FY, FX. And we have our known, our known external force, right, that this whole frame is supporting. So we've drawn all of our forces. What's our step now? What? Why, why BE? Find the two force members. Okay. 
Exactly. If we look at our two force members, okay, I immediately know that they are BE and CF. Does that make sense why, why they're two force members? Okay. If it's a little confusing, go back to that first rigid body lecture. Okay, when we derived um, two force and three force members. Okay. But let's take, a, let's take a moment and use some of our intuition here. For BE, okay, to maintain this position that it's drawn in, okay, to be in equilibrium, how, what, can, what do I know about the position of the resultant forces? Equal, well, yeah, we know they're equal and opposite. It's a two-force member. Yeah? They have the same line of action. Okay, we know that. Yeah, Jack, sorry. They're completely, They're completely vertical. Why? Fantastic. Okay. They're completely vertical. Okay. And I'm pretty much just going to repeat what Jack said because it was perfect. They're completely vertical because the beam is vertical, so there's no reaction force in the X. And because it's a two force member, we know they're equal and opposite. Okay. So I can update, <coughs> update my forces. That was B E. Let's see, that's okay. Draw B and F. Shoot, I'll draw that in compression. B and F equal and opposite, acting in the vertical direction. B and E, yes. Just making sure you guys are paying attention. Okay. So based on what Jack said about uh, member BE, what do we know about member CF? This one's a little easier because we've already done it. The forces are oriented along the line of action of the beam. Okay. In order to maintain that position, Okay. Okay. You can draw them however you want. Okay. The sign convention will dictate our 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 answers. Will stay with me here. All right. So we've identified these two force members. Okay. Yeah, Keenan. Does it matter whether it's pushing in or pushing out? Nope. Okay, it does not matter the way you draw these. Okay. Your math, your sign convention will tell you if you've drawn it correctly or not. So now that we've identified our two force members, what's our next step? You're close, Aaron. Not yet. Update your free body diagrams, right? The whole reason for identifying this, these was to reduce the number of unknowns. Okay, so we can update okay, our free body diagrams. Okay, to solve to solve for the number of unknowns to solve for all of our unknowns. <coughs> all right. So you find your two force members, you find those forces, okay, and then update them on the multi-force members. In this case, that was member, <coughs> excuse me, A, B, C, and D, E, F. All right. So before you solve, okay, take a, take a step and make sure you check two things. The first being, have you taken into account all of the two force members? Okay. And then have you replaced those two force members, re replaced those multi-force members with those known two force lines of action? Okay. And also double check that all of your reaction forces are equal and opposite. Okay. So then, Aaron, then what do we do? Then we look at those individual free body diagrams. 
and then we apply our equations of equilibrium. All right? <coughs> so in looking at these four members, okay, where would you start? There's no wrong answer. BE? Do we know those forces? You could start there, but we know that B would have to equal E in the Y. That's fine. Yeah? I see B, E, F in some of the forces of X. Excellent. Drew said he'd start with D, E, F and sum the forces in the X because we only have one unknown that's acting in the X. Okay. And so there's no right answer okay, in terms of which, which member to start with. Okay. You'll work through and you'll kind of figure out where you have your unknowns and knowns. Okay, but try to start with a member that you can solve for something right away. Okay? So if we start with DEF and we sum the moments at X, oops, sum the forces in the X, okay, we have 1800 okay, plus F. Okay, and if I look at my dimensions of the frame, this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Okay. So it's F times 3 fifths equals 0, that rectangular component in the x direction. All right? So solving for this. This force in the, in the member CF get negative <coughs> 3,000 newtons. And what does that negative sign tell us? That it's going the other direction, that we've drawn it wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So now we've solved for F. Okay. Now we should solve for D or E. Okay. We need to do that eventually. So I. The way I work this is I sum the moments at D okay, to negate the unknown of dy and just solve for the force in E. Okay. So I get minus E times 3. Okay. The force at E is applying a clockwise rotation about D. Mm -hmm. And he asks, when you get that negative number, when you find out that, that E, that, excuse me, that F was drawn incorrectly, okay, as you go through and are solving for your forces in each of the members, update your signs. Okay? <coughs> the same with trusses as we update our, our uh, tension and compression internal forces. Okay? Update the signs. And the same okay, in this member, because we know it's, it's pointing down and to the left, so it is applying what direction of a moment about point D? I heard it. Negative. Negative. Okay. It's a cl it's a clockwise rotation. Okay, and we need to account for the true sign. Okay, it's it's true orientation. Okay, so we update our sign at F. Okay, we know it's pointing down and to the left. I take my rectangular component about D okay, in the vertical direction because that's my effective force. That's the only force that's causing rotation about D. Multiply that vertical component times the horizontal distance, which is 6. Okay. I also have to account for that 800 Newton force that's acting at the end of the beam. Okay. So in solving for force E, I get that to be negative 7,200 newtons. Okay. And again, I've drawn it incorrectly. That's fine. Okay. And so now we can apply our third equation of equilibrium. Okay. We can sum the forces in the Y. Okay, we get dy plus the force in E. Okay, 
minus 3,000 okay, times 4 fifths, that rectangular component in the j direction, minus 800. Okay, and that equals 0. And so solving for dy, I get dy equal to negative 400 newtons. So again, we've drawn it incorrectly, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So we've solved for three unknowns in member DEF. Okay. So then go through and do exactly what Nakia said and update your free body diagrams. Okay. So if we update our, our force at C, okay, we know it actually is acting okay, in this direction. Okay, we know that the force at E or at B is 7,200. Okay. For that to be a two-force member, I know that the force at E which we solved for, is also 7,200. So I kind of went backwards there, I'm sorry. Kay. We knew the force at E is 7,200. We need to draw it equal and opposite. Kay. And because this is a two-force member, I solve for the force at B to be the same, just in the opposite direction. Is that okay? Okay, so what's our only unknown here? of all of our free body diagrams? AY. AY, okay. We do not know AY. Okay, so that one's pretty easy to solve for, okay, because it's our only unknown. Okay, so you can sum the moments about B or C, okay, or you can just, I would probably just sum the forces in the Y. Okay, one less step. Some of the forces in the y, a y, okay, needed to update that, minus 7,200 plus 3,000, okay, the force in C, so do what I say, not what I do, okay, I needed to update the force in B in, in at C. I look at the member BE, we knew that the force at E was 7,200. Okay, so therefore, this force at B is 7,200, okay, in the equal and opposite direction. But because this is a constraint to maintain Newton's second law, I need to update FB, FBE, okay, draw it equal and opposite here, and the same for the force at C. Do you have a question, Jake? I think I might have answered it, but why was it plus 7,200 instead of minus 7,200 originally? That's our first step. That's why it's supposed to be a DEF, not that one. Some of the forces, the Y? Some of the forces in the Y, the, this E? Yeah, why was that plus 7,200? Because we found that E okay, was actually negative, so we drew it wrong. Okay. It actually is oriented up. We had originally oriented it down. Okay, so we updated it as we solved for our equation. Yes, yeah, Stefan? So we, uh, in the original view, uh, we had the forces of Y of the whole entire structure. Uh -huh. We had AY plus DY equal to 800. So we just plug in DY and find AY. Say that again. You can absolutely use that equation, okay? So Stefan remembered at the beginning of the problem, we summed the forces in the y, we had ay plus dy equals 800, okay? You can immediately plug in dy to solve for ay, okay? Or you can go back to your rigid body, uh, free body diagram of abc and solve for ay. You'll get the same thing, all right? So there's a couple, um, there's two more examples, okay? I know we went kind of slow and step by step, which is fine. But I will post those today. Okay. 
Um, a couple things about pre-lab. Okay, remember tomorrow, pre-lab is tomorrow. Okay, in your assigned lab sections. There is no pre-lab on Wednesday. And Dr. Davidson is doing a recitation. Okay, and I'm going to ask him just to do a module three review for our test on, on Monday. Okay, this is an extra credit. I know he said it was, but we got our wires crossed. Only our planned recitations are extra credit. So pre-lab tomorrow. Yeah? In CMK 111, where our normal lab is. Okay, so pretend you have lab tomorrow. 